Skype. Okay. Get in there. Five, four, three, two, one. When you're ready. My guest today is Anwar Nuseba. We're here at his home in Jerusalem where he was born and has lived all his life. Mr. Nuseba was for a period of time in the Jordanian parliament and has occupied many posts in that government, including the post of Minister of Defense. Mr. Nuseba, I'd like to begin by asking you, we here in the States, this concept of Arab unity. And from the time of the War of Independence, when the State of Israel was created in 1948, from 1948 until 1967, Egypt either occupied or controlled the Gaza Strip, Jordan occupied or controlled the West Bank, and neither of those fellow Arab states saw fit to create a separate state for their Palestinian brothers. So then, considering that historical fact, how can the Palestinians realistically expect the Israelis to permit them to create a state that close to the Israeli borders? Yes, well, I said it would be a misconception to call the presence of Egyptian troops in Gaza and uh, Jordanian, if you want, troops in the West Bank uh, as uh, constituting an occupation. It wasn't an occupation. In my opinion, uh, fighting broke out in 1948. And uh, we in Palestine, the Arabs, were really equipped to meet the challenge for whatever reason. It doesn't matter. We don't have to go into the background. While uh, the other side were extremely well prepared. And uh, the British, who were then in charge of the mandate, had only one interest, and that is to withdraw and uh, ensure their lines of communications for withdrawal. But beyond that, they were losing interest in what was happening. Therefore, it's a case of, uh, you know, everybody for himself, and God takes the hindmost. And in those conditions, if you remember, the refugee problem was created uh, as a result of the occupation, and this was an occupation, uh, by uh, the Haganah at that time of Arab areas, even areas that had been allotted to the Palestinian state by virtue of the partition resolution, uh, where uh, the other uh, Jewish organizations, Israeli organizations, Zionist organizations, call them what you will, uh, the Etzel the, and all these people, uh, perpetrated um, uh, certain atrocities in some Arab villages, and I'm thinking particularly of the village of Deir Yassin in the Jerusalem area, in which uh, women, old men, children were killed, uh, with the result that uh, the, the Arabs in Palestine, the Palestinian Arabs, were in a very, very critical situation. Caused by originally, though, the invasion of Egypt. No, Syria. this is before. This is before the Egyptians, the Syrians, the Lebanese, and the Jordanians came in. I am talking about the period between November 1947 and April May 1948, before the coming into, uh, before Israel was became a state. In fact, May of during during that period that uh, uh, there were many appeals from the people in Palestine. In the first place, there were appeals for arms. We were unarmed. People had to pay, I remember, about 100 Palestinian pounds, which was equal to a sterling pound in those days, for a rifle, and sometimes even more. You mean Egypt and the other Arab Not countries? Not Egypt. I'm not no, talking. I'm talking would, the would, Palestinians. Yeah, but wouldn't Egypt and the neighboring Arab countries supply the Palestinians with arms under the circumstances that you describe? Uh, the Palestinians were buying their own arms at that time. Whatever arms the Arab armies had 
were used by the Arab armies themselves, were intended for use by the Arab armies, not for the Palestinians. So the Palestinians had to seek their arms somewhere else. Of course, they were helped, but not a great deal. Now, uh, in those conditions, there were appeals by the Palestinians to the Arab countries to try and stem this tremendous pressure, tremendous danger to which they were exposed. And it was in this spirit that the Arab armies entered Palestine at the request of the Palestine people themselves. In order, and at that time, the late Azam Pasha, who was Secretary General of the Arab League, sent a cable to the United Nations Secretary. I don't remember the name of the man at the time. He told him that we are going in not in order to uh, attack or be the aggressors against anybody, but in order to restore order. This is the only reason. And as a matter of fact, if you will look at the map, you will find that the Arab armies did not exceed the line which was uh, uh, designed by the United Nations resolution as the line dividing the Palestine state from the Israeli state at that time. Uh, in the end, they were not even successfully keeping the Arab areas of Palestine under the partition resolution, but this is another matter. Now, therefore, they were not, uh, they were not occupiers. What happened in the West Bank is a little different from what happened in Gaza. If you know something about the background history of this country, about the Great Rebellion of 1916, if you remember, about the Hussein MacMahon Agreement, about the Balfour Declaration, about all this historical background, you will recall perhaps that the Arabs at that time sought to be united, sought to be a united Arab nation sought to break away from the Ottomans, not because they were against the Ottomans, but because in the context of modern ideas, they wanted to be independent, and they wanted to be united as an Arab people. Just to put it in context, the Turkish Ottoman Empire basically controlled the area of Palestine from about 1516 until the end of World War I. The basic uh, concept is that the Ottoman Empire, as we see it, was a trustee uh, by virtue of, if you want, whatever. They, they were the heirs in this area to an earlier empire which we ourselves had that controlled the whole area, including this. And they were a continuation of the same line. But the time came when uh, the Arabs and the Turks had to part company. And the Turks, by the way, started this process themselves, when they started the, what they called the Turanian movement, which emphasized the Turkish nature of the Ottoman Empire rather than its Ottoman nature. In other words, I, as an Arab, could be a citizen in the Ottoman Empire. My uh, great uncle could be a minister in the Ottoman Empire. Uh, my relatives could be members of the Ottoman Parliament because Ottoman did not mean Turkish. It meant all the people living within the Ottoman Empire, including the Arabs. Uh, the Turanian movement started to emphasize the Turkish character of the Ottoman Empire. Now, we are not Turks, we are Arabs. Therefore, from the Turkish side, from the Ottoman side, and from the Arab side, there was a movement away, the, each from the other. And uh, the motivation behind this Arab movement was unity and independence. And uh, the grandfather of the present King of Jordan was the leader of this movement. Abdullah, Therefore, uh, Abdullah King Abdullah? No, Hussein. Hussein. But well, wasn't his, gran his grandfather? His grandfather was Abdullah. His great grandfather. Great grandfather. I'm sorry. Uh, therefore, uh, for us people living, and, and, and the only thing which stopped this, there were two things which stopped it. On the one hand, there was the Balfour Declaration, which was given without our consent and behind our backs. In 1917. And which we never, never recognized. And given before Britain even occupied this country, before they conquered it, if you want. 
and given to a people who did not live here. That was one thing. The other thing is uh, the Sykes-Picot Agreement, which, uh, uh, under which uh, this area was divided among the various powers, France, Britain, and Russia at that time, Tsarist so Russia, and uh, also behind our backs, also in conflict with the commitments which the Allies had undertaken towards us as regards unity, as regards independence. Therefore, Palestine to us was a part of a larger uh, Arab nation. Well, well, let's look at the concept of Arab unity, not so much in, in the historical sense, but let, let's if, look at If I may continue, if I may continue, please, uh, allow me, because this is, uh, you told me, it's, I'll, I'll only lose my, you know, line of thinking. And I told you that Palestine regarded itself and looked upon itself as part of an Arab nation as part of one people, with the Arab people outside Palestine. This particularization over the Palestinianness of the Palestinian conflict came about really very much in response to the Zionist movement itself, which was directed, which was aimed mainly at Palestine, and therefore had to be met mainly by the Palestinians. Now, in 1940, Nine, I think it was, or 1950. There was a, a referendum, if you want. And there were parliamentary elections. And the people were asked whether they wanted to be united. To them, united is a natural uh, state of things. And they accepted to be united, the two banks together. However, United did not mean, and this is mentioned in the resolution declaring the, uni the, 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 the Union, that this Union is without prejudice to Palestinian rights in the context of international resolutions and basic natural rights. Whenever the time came for the Palestinian problem to be resolved, then the Union that was achieved in 1950 would not stop, stand in the way. And therefore, there was a union. Now you tell me, why is it that the Palestinians were not given a separate entity as a nation within uh, west of the Jordan? By Egypt and Jordan. No, no, I'm talking of Jordan now. Well, there were many reasons for this, but perhaps one of them is that whatever would happen, on the West Bank could only hope to happen in the context of a resolution of the conflict with the Israelis. And that resolution had not come about. Therefore, what was attempted in 1949-1950 between the East and the West Bank was of a, a I won't say temporary, but what was, was, was a measure that was found necessary that was found necessary because of uh, economic, military, other, other uh, imperatives, and that did not, uh, what do you call it? Now, to form a Palestinian state, it was, it was sought at the time, to form a Palestinian state. But in order to form it, Israel would have had to give up the territories which it had, it had occupied territories that belong to the Arab state under the partition resolution. All right, but excluding, Israel, West, excluding the West Bank and Gaza, which Israel gained in the 67 war. Because it, prior to 67, Israel did not have those areas. No. The West Bank and Gaza. No, but West Bank and Gaza together were less than the area which was allotted to the Arabs under the partition. You had to have the territory that Israel acquired in, other in the 48 words, the territory war. which Israel acquired and which Israel, when, when they were uh, admitted to the United Nations, said expressly they would be willing to respect the United Nations resolutions. Two resolutions, two main resolutions. One of them about the right of the refugees for repatriation or compensation. Two, about uh, the partition resolution number 182 of 1947. 
Now, had Israel accepted to implement those two resolution, resolutions, a Palestinian state would have come about in the context of the partition resolution. But Israel did not. Therefore, what impeded the formation of a Palestinian state was neither Jordan nor Egypt, but Israel itself, because Israel refused to implement the resolutions of the United Nations. To give back the territory that it had not taken over that, in 47 and 48. To respect the resolution which brought it into existence as an independent Right, but state. What, what you're saying is that the West Bank and Gaza, because we hear all this talk of going back to the pre-67 borders, but according to what you've just said, that still wouldn't be sufficient. Israel would have to turn over the land it acquired in the War of Independence in 48. I think we are confusing two things now. I was talking in a historical context. I was telling you why in 1950, not now, in 1950, the impediment towards forming a Palestinian state was neither Egypt nor Jordan. No, I don't think I'm, I'm not talking about now. No, but, but I understand. Now, but, in, but in 1950, the West Bank and Jordan that we hear so much talk about today was in Arab hands, not in Israeli hands. This is true. On the other hand, the West Bank itself, the West Bankers elected for a union in, with Jordan. Having elected for a union with Jordan, having been given all the rights and obligations that emanated from that union, that they were eligible to elect, that they were eligible to be elected to parliament, that they were eligible for citizenship. Uh, all these things added to the fact that forming a Palestinian state then would have been a, 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 a cancellation of the, of, of the United Nations resolution on the question of Palestine taking all these things into consideration. What I am saying is that it wasn't Jordan that stopped it. It was Israel's refusal to implement the resolutions at that time. Egypt was a different matter. Egypt... Well, they, they, I'm getting this thing together. Mm -hmm. What are they doing outside? They're in the uh, mobile unit, looking, listening. I got enough problems of my own. I don't really pay attention. I, you know, I assume they're doing what should be done to make it a high quality. <clears throat> in America, uh, Egypt's Anwar Sadat is a hero. He probably does better in the public opinion polls than any Israeli leader. Now, of course, in one sense, Israel and Egypt have signed a separate peace, and then there's all the talk about Israel and Egypt negotiating the issue of autonomy on the West Bank and Gaza. Now, you're a Palestinian. Number one, how do you feel about Anwar Sadat? And number two, do you and others like you authorize him in Israel to negotiate that issue in your behalf? Uh, on point one, I have, cannot have any particular feeling about President Anwar Sadat, except in so far as his conduct affects my case, my cause. In so far as his conduct affected my cause, I feel terribly badly about him. Uh, the second question is whether we authorized him. We did not. I, as a Jordanian citizen, Palestinian born, Jordanian citizen, living in my city of Jerusalem, felt that under Resolution 242, Jordan, as the country that lost, that went to war with Israel and lost the territory to Israel in 1967, was the country that should claim the liberation of the occupied territories in accordance with Resolution 242, in implementation of Resolution 242. This was my feeling. This did not succeed. And we don't have to go into the reasons.
1973, there was this uh, Yom Kippur War. And in 1974, it was resolved at Rabat that the Palestine Liberation Organization should carry their responsibility of representing the Palestine cause before the whole world. From that time, Jordan was no longer a party to whatever negotiations, or what you like to call them, that could have developed. Is that a mistake? In order, is that? A mistake? Certainly not, certainly not. And, and whether it is or not is beside the point. The point is that this is the position now, that the PLO are the sole legitimate representatives of the Palestinians. And I haven't ever heard of Mr. Anwar Sadat being the representative of the PLO or being a member of the PLO. He is quite different. Well, did the Palestinians themselves ever have the opportunity to vote on whether or not the PLO should be their sole representative? How do, how do Americans know that the majority of Palestinians really wish the PLO to be their representative? Whenever an Israeli is asked the question, the Israeli says, there are many moderate, sensible Palestinians who want absolutely nothing to do with Yasser Arafat or the PLO. But if they say such publicly, or they condemn Arafat publicly, they will be murdered. I do not for a minute concede that the PLO is not sensible or is not moderate. I will not concede that. I will not concede the argument that there are a, a bunch of murderers as they are sometimes called. I do not concede that. Well, who, who, who's been throwing the bombs at, at women and children? I would like to know some of the bombs. Who has been thrown? Well, who went into, we don't know. Who went into May who May has, and killed children? Uh, my you, dear you sir. You talked about Dar Yassin in 47. Yes, but let, let's, I do. All right, but yes. let's talk about things, I mean, more recently. Yes. Have, has not the PLO been behind that? Do you reject that? Because that's all we hear in the United States. Have you heard in the, uh, in the United States of the bombing of, of civilians in Beirut? Yes. Have you heard of the bombing of, of women and children in refugee camps? Yes. Who did that? Was it the PLO who, who did, that did it? Or, be, or was it, was it uh, Israel? I'll be happy to respond to that, but do you not concede that the murderers of the 11 Israeli athletes at the 72 Olympics in Munich and that the murderers of the children in a kibbutz were representatives of the PLO. Well, frankly, I, this is, a pro, this is a, an issue over which I, can neither, which I can neither concede nor deny, because I don't know. Like you, I read it in the press. For instance, until now, I don't know who it was who blew up the mayor of Nablus, or the mayor of Ramallah, or who attempted the life of the mayor of, of the, until now, I don't know that. But I'm prepared to until say, until now, now, but, 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 but let, me, let me just make this point. I'm I prepared, wish you'd allow me no, to continue. But You're I, a lawyer, but I, not a lawyer. I'm prepared to say, and I think any Jew and any Israeli w would say, that if a Jew or an Israeli bombed the mayor of Nablus so that he lost his life or lost his legs, that would be a terrible thing. But I never hear a Palestinian concede the obvious that the people who were doing the terrorist acts in Israel who crossed the border for the purpose of throwing bombs on buses and indiscriminately killing people are representatives of terrorist organizations of the Palestinians. I think we are sidestepping the point. I would agree with you that violence is to be deprecated. I would agree with you as a general principle. But what, what I was telling you was something else. What I was telling you is that I read in the papers, as you read in the papers, and I hear on the radio, but I don't know that it is this or that party that this did this or that thing. And without knowing, I am not ready either to deny or to concede. This is the whole thing. Well, I never saw, now, Hitler, I never saw Hitler kill no. a single human being. But, but yet, never. There's, I never saw Hitler with my own eyes kill a single human being. But I mean, we have to have some you know, sense of balance and propriety. There, there can be no doubt in my mind but that Hitler was a mass murderer and that Stalin was a mass murderer. For me to believe otherwise, I would have to believe that all the media was involved in a conspiracy. Would you, call, would you have called Kenyatta a mass, mur mass murderer? Would you have called uh, Bishop Makarios a mass murderer? Would you have called everybody, Mugabe, 
No, I would not, would, but I would, would certainly have, have called Idi Amin a mass murderer. But, but why? Why? I mean, why this bias against the people? Look, I'm not advocating. I'm not defending terrorism. Far from it. I, I, I abhor it. But I also know that these people have been living in refugee camps for, for more than 30 years. They have been living on hope and nothing more. They have been denied every dignity every human dignity, the right to work, the right to learn, the right to work and, and, and produce and be members of society, the right to self-determination, they have been denied everything. Even those amongst them who have lived in, 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 in the Gulf area, who have made good, if you want, who have done well, who have made money, they are not given passports, they are not given the right to vote. They live like aliens. You should understand that. But here, living like aliens forever is not a future for any human. Here, here is something that is really non-comprehensible <coughs> to most Americans. We can understand all the Arab countries saying we despise Israel, Israel has done terrible things, Israel should disappear, whatever. Be that as it may, their brothers are suffering the kinds of deprivation, supposedly, that you have just described. So. Temporarily, why cannot rich Saudi Arabia or Egypt take these terribly deprived refugees and say to them, look, on a temporary basis, we will put you in these areas of our country, we will give you normal, decent lives, and then someday when we destroy Israel, you will have your home again. But in the interim, for generation after generation, we're not going to let you live this kind of a life. I'll give you one concrete example. At one time, I was Minister of Development and Reconstruction in Jordan. It was part of my duty to look after the refugees. I agreed to a project. I was very much criticized at the time by people who thought I was unpatriotic, who thought I was selling out on the Palestinian problem. I wasn't really. to rehabilitate the refugees, to make them lead productive, dignified lives by using, marshalling the use of the Jordan and Yarmouk waters. And we sought the help of the Americans in funds and in expertise. And we thought everything was going very well. I expected the opposition to come from within but believe me, the opposition came from without. We were stopped, we were prevented, we were diverted into a larger scheme which never worked anyway because Israel had objections. Now this is a personal experience which I have. I do not for a minute advocate that the refugees should remain in refugee camps. But I do believe, and I do not advocate all the extreme measures which you have mentioned as regards Israel. But I do advocate that the Palestinian refugees, with the help and the cooperation of the Israelis themselves, should be given, and the Israelis should understand this more than anybody else, should be given the chance to be rehabilitated, to have the right of self-determination, not anywhere but in their own country. And this is their country. It has been for thousands of years, whatever you say. But that, that obviously is not going to happen on a voluntary basis coming from the State of Israel. Five wars have been fought since the creation of the State of Israel. And uh, quite frankly, the Arabs have not done terribly well in, in any of those wars. No. So, so what happens, I mean, this situation could go on for another 30, 40 years or indefinitely. The Israelis hope it will continue uh, into infinity. And in the meantime, are the Palestinians going to be there as a burr, as a thorn, with people such as yourself simply saying the Israelis are wrong, but yet the practical everyday lot of your people never changing? Well, I think there should be a change on both sides. You say we've had to face five wars at which we have not done very well. This is true. Let's try the battle of peace, but it has to be on both sides. 
perhaps we can do better on both sides. But Sadat's argument is that he was the only Arab leader to try the battle of peace, and he receives nothing but criticism and condemnation. President Sadat, that his initiative, his attempt to achieve peace for himself, for the liberation of Sinai, is fine. Fine. No one is against that. But when he starts talking about the Palestinian cause, in terms which are an uh, abortion of the Palestinian people's right, then he does not represent the Palestinians. Explain why his position is, On an, the abortion, Palestinian cause, is an abortion of the Palestinian Well, Well, it, it, it's, it's too long an argument. But uh, autonomy is not acceptable. Autonomy is not self-determination. It is not the answer. It is not a solution. That is compatible, if you want, with uh, human dignity and human rights, basic human natural rights. I tell you, the reason why the Israelis insist on autonomy are twofold. On the one hand, because they do not wish to give up the territory, and let's be frank about it. And if they do not wish to give up the territory, then obviously they do not wish to implement Resolution 242. And when President Sadat talks about implementing Resolution 242, then he, is, he does not know what the Israelis' thinking on the subject is. Point one. Point two, Israel says that it is concerned with its security. If this is the case, then we can sit on a compatible basis and discuss issues of security in, uh, uh, in relation to the two sides, not to be one-sided. This we can do. But autonomy is not acceptable. Look, when the British were here, we were more than autonomous. We, the Palestinian people, we were an independent people. We were recognized as an independent, sovereign people by Article 22 of the Covenant of the League of Nations. But there was no Palestinian state or there nation. There was a Palestinian state in embryo, and this is this in is embryo. Yes, and this is recognized in Article 22 of the, of, of the Covenant of the League of Nations. And this is the reason why we did not recognize the mandate. This is the reason why we did not recognize the Balfour Declaration. Now you ask me to recognize Mr. Sadat's autonomy, I will not do it. Well, what kind of crazy world are we living in where everyone talks about Sadat and autonomy and Israel, and what you're saying is that even assuming, hypothetically, that Israel and Sadat would agree on some kind of solution for the Palestinians, the Palestinians would reject it out of hand. That's right. It's for the Palestinians to accept such a solution. Now, is this so strange? Is, this, is it crazy for me? No, it's, it, that's not crazy for you to say you reject it. It's no. crazy for two other people to be negotiating right. your rights right. when that's you have already told them right. in advance that whatever you to agree, for the first agree time, to, we're for going the, to spit at. For, for the first time, I agree with you. <laughs> All right? Uh -huh. Now, we're, we're sitting in your, in your very lovely home in Jerusalem where you live. And uh, Jerusalem is now unified under Jewish rule. Uh, in addition to your governmental post in Jordan, you're an attorney. On an everyday practical basis, are you harassed by the Israeli government? Is your life made and no, you seem no. to be perfectly free to come and go? No, no, there's nothing like that. The only thing is uh, I don't accept. Uh, that Jerusalem is united. I don't accept that Israel has the right to unite it. Uh, I don't accept that Israel has the right to extend its laws to my area of Jerusalem, that it should uh, uh, exercise jurisdiction in my Jerusalem. But on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, I, I suffer no harassment. Beyond official harassment in my job as, as director, uh, managing director of the electricity company, but this is a different matter. Right, but aside from these psychological deep-rooted factors, your day-to-day -day life and the day-to-day -day life of, of, of your family. I'm not harassed. I cannot uh, practice my law because I have boycotted the courts on account of the annexation of Arab Jerusalem. Beyond that, I'm not But harassed. that's your decision. That is my decision. Okay. I'm not harassed. You My wife is being had up for, for uh, participating in a, in a demonstration. She didn't really. She participated in a peaceful procession 
uh, in memory of the death of two people who had died very, very unjustly. But this is, this is a different battle. I mean, this is... If there was, an, this is a, an opinion question asking hypothetically, if there were an election held in Jordan today between King Hussein and Arafat, who would win? Uh, really, this is not only a hypothetical question. I think it's a very uh, harmful question because as I see it, there is no uh, competition between King Hussein and uh, Mr. Arafat. So King, I Hussein and I Jordan, King Hussein and Jordan, probably in the 1970 civil war with the Palestinians, killed more Palestinians than Israel ever has. And as a matter of fact, King Hussein, in 1970, when his regime looked like it would fall, asked both the United States and Israel for their assistance. In the first place, I disagree. I, I'm not defending what happened in 1970 and 1971. Not in the least. It was very unfortunate. Uh, but it is not the fact that more Palestinians were killed during that year than have been killed by the Israelis and the British together. Because after all, it is one policy. It started in 19... what? 20? 21? I do not accept that. I just that. got the signal. Cassette is right. Okay, change cassette. Probably about another ten minutes. About another ten minutes yes. we'll go. Good. My God, what a sweat. Mm -hmm. Five. You'll be continuing. Two, yeah. one. Yes, I, I, I said that I, deplorable as the incident was, I don't think that it would be right to say that there were more Palestinians that lost their lives in 1970 than uh, Palestinians uh, losing their lives at the hands of the Israelis and the Jews before Israel came to, into existence and the British combined all on account of implementing a policy which was unjust to the Palestinian people. But, I mean, doesn't that civil war of 1970 between Jordan and the PLO make the love affair talk of recent days seem very hypocritical and public relations oriented? Well, sir, you would have to direct your question to the parties involved directly rather than to me. Personally, I don't think... Uh, uh, I mean, there is more to bind the two sides together than there is to separate them. And therefore, despite what happened in 1970, uh, our basic interests impel us to be one people. Right, but basically what happened... Therefore, I don't accept that there is any competition. Right. But what happened in 1970, to call a, a fact a fact, is that Jordanian Arabs were killing PLO or Palestinian Arabs and vice versa. That's what was going on in the, in the Jordanian Civil War of 1970-71. I mean, it was, it was not just an argument. It was a matter of Arab brothers killing Arab brothers. Okay. For reasons which... which okay, for, for reasons. Th there are always reasons. And let's take it, let's not talk only about 1970. Let's talk about 1981 in terms of the concept of Arab unity. Iran, Iraq, the situation again, in Lebanon. Again, again, unfortunate, again, unfortunate. I have no answer. Do you see anything on the horizon? I, 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 do, I do think that uh, in the Lebanon things could improve. I do think that uh, without Israel intruding itself too, too much in Lebanese affairs, the Lebanese people will be able to resolve their problems in amity and in brotherliness. Lebanon has lived as a free country for a long time. It has been a, an example uh, to other people of free institutions, of democracy, of free speech, of all the good things a thriving people, an intelligent people. It's, it's a shocking uh, disaster. This should happen to them.
And I think that Israel bears some of the responsibility. I'm sorry, but this is my view. But in that situation, it's interesting that no one from the world community is saying that the Christians are entitled to a separate state. And certain Americans draw a parallel between the Palestinian situation in the sense that basically you have an area of territory, an area of land, where there are two contending forces which can obviously not live together in peace. No, this is untrue. They can and they have lived together in peace. It is only uh, political manipulations that have made them fight against each other. It is not our philosophy that Muslims and Christians and Jews can live together. It is rather our philosophy than they can, that they can live together. We are not religiously oriented, we are not racially oriented. We believe in the possibility of people coexisting in the same, in the same country, as you do in America. You have Jews, you have Christians of all denominations. You have blacks, you have whites, you have every, every kind of people. Are you telling me that there should be separate states for each different community, different race, different religion? It would be a crazy America if you, if you did that. And, and, and this is exactly how we feel about the Middle East. Well, how do you feel about America's contribution or lack of contribution? toward the Palestinian aspirations now in 1981 and let's say in the future and in the last several years? Do you think America has been constructive I or wasn't, destructive? I wasn't very happy that America was bamboozled into believing that the, the autonomous scheme is, is a, a legitimate interpretation of Resolution 242. Uh, I'm not very happy. Uh, I don't know what has uh, come out of the, the meeting between Mr. Begin and Mr. Reagan recently, but uh, if it means an alliance against me and my interests, I will not be very happy with it. So I don't really know. Well, the specifics are almost beside the point because you know that America is absolutely committed to the Camp David pe peace process, which is a process that you and your people abhor. When you tell me absolutely committed, are you telling me that America is absolutely committed to Israel's interpretation of, of its obligations towards the Palestinian people? Because I don't accept that. I don't accept that for a minute. I remember the Rogers uh, Initiative, for instance, which was very, very clear and very, very open. And it called upon the Israelis to withdraw. You're now, talking this is Secretary this of State William right. Rogers this, and the Nixon that's right. administration. That's right. Now, this is entirely different from the autonomy concept. Therefore, uh, this is America, and if you tell me that America is committed to this, I don't accept it. In realistic terms, if a prominent Palestinian, a respected Palestinian, tomorrow morning got on the radio, got on television, and said something to this effect, I'm sick of this whole business, I'm sick of the terror, I'm sick of the killing, I think Israel is wrong, but realistically, I don't think that Israel is going to give in. I'm not willing for my family and my children to continue this kind of life, and I want to go along with the autonomy process. I reject Arafat, and I reject the PLO. Would he live a week if he said that? Would he live a week? Would he live a week? He'd live a century if his health uh, was, was good enough. But he wouldn't have a single follower from among, the, among the Palestinians. Not a single one? Not a single one. You honestly believe and feel that the opinion of the Palestinians is that homogeneous? Yes. What exactly, in, in, in just very specific terms, does Israel have to do today? Let's say instead make, make of, let's say, in, let's, say, let's say instead of Stanley Rosenblatt sitting here, uh, Menachem Begin or the leader of the Israeli government says, okay, we're sick of it. We want to make peace. What what do you people want for us to do that the killing and the terror will cease and that we can live in peace in this area? It's very simple. In the same way that you have succeeded to establish your state and to live in dignity, and you have earned it, so we would like also to be recognized as having the same right, at least the same right, in a country which is ours. And together we can, we can do wonders, you know, I think.
All right, but that your, your answer was really a general answer. I mean, specifically, what specifically, does Israel? Specifically, I'm not the PLO. You should ask the PLO what they want. Mr. Nuseba, thank you very much. Thank you. You've given me a very hard time. <laughs> <laughs> then I succeeded. Okay, we're just going to do some intercuts now. Can you look at... Uh... I look at him. Admiringly or with other emotions. <laughs> <laughs> well, sorry, Stanley, can we have the clothes again? They want it again? The clothes again? Yeah. Finished? No. Another. Repeat. Okay, when you're ready, Stanley. Ready. Go. Right. Mr. Nuseba, thank you very much. Not at all. Do I repeat what I said first? All right. 